If you own your own business and you're doing well, making earnings, you're entitled to take earnings out of the business. But if it's a publicly traded company that you're a manager of or a CEO of, and the company is doing well, and returning cash to shareholders requires a formal process. The board of directors usually get together and decide how much the company should pay out as dividends. And for much of the last century, that was the only cash flow equity investors got, regular or special dividends. Starting about 40 years ago, US companies started the process, but now global companies have joined the mix. Increasingly, companies have returned cash to shareholders in the form of buybacks. What do buybacks do? They return cash to shareholders, but only to those shareholders who sell their shares back. That might sound a little unfair, but remember the remaining shareholders benefit from having fewer shares outstanding trading at a higher price. Now in this data set that you're looking at, I've classified companies and industries and looked at the amount companies pay out as dividends and the amount they use to buy back stock broken down by industry. Now, as you look at this, you also might want to think about how much a company can return to its shareholders in dividends or buybacks. To measure this, this potential dividend, I'm going to create a term called free cash flow equity. Sounds fancy, but it's a cash left over after you've met every conceivable need for equity investors. So to measure this free cash flow equity, I start with net income. Why net income? Because that is the measure of earnings to equity investors. The problem with net income is it's an accounting earnings number, not a cash flow number. To make that transition to cash flows, I do two things. One is I add back depreciation and amortization. Why? Because it's an accounting expense, but it's not a cash expense. But I also subtract out capex, which accountants might not treat as an accounting expense, but it's a cash outflow. In fact, if you net those two items out, capex versus depre and depreciation and amortization, you have what's called net capex. That's a measure of how much the company is putting back into the business. Now, on top of that, you can also have accounts receivable, accounts payable, working capital items. Now, what, why do those working capital items show up? Because accounting earnings are usually accrual earnings. What that means is if you sell something by December 30th the 31st, you can show it as revenues, even though you haven't been paid for it yet. And if you use items before the end of the year and you haven't paid for them, that will show up as expenses during the year, even though you haven't paid for them yet. You see, what does that all mean? It shows up as working capital. The amounts owed to you on sales will show up as receivables. The amounts you owe other people will show up as payables. And the items you carry over from year to year will show up as inventory. In fact, change in working capital is just a way of converting accrual earnings to cash earnings. So let's see where we are. You start with net income, you subtract net capex, you subtract change in working capital. And then you have to factor in that some of these needs for reinvestment and working capital might come from debt. So to the extent that you increase the amount of debt and you measure that by looking at debt repaid, you know, set off against new borrowings, you can cover some of that reinvestment with debt. So net income plus net and minus net capex minus change in working capital, plus net borrowing, if you're borrowing money that you to cover some of your needs. But remember, in some years, you might repay more than you borrow. So it could be a minus in those years, equals free cash flow equity. You can have a company with positive net income. And if you have enough net capex and change in working capital, and you don't use much debt, you could end up with negative free cash flow equity. Conversely, you can have a company with negative net income, losing money, but if your depreciation exceeds your capex, your working capital decreased, and you borrowed money that year, you can end up with positive free cash flow equity. Notice that every item <clears throat> in, this, in this picture comes out of one accounting statement, the statement of cash flows. The net income is at the top of the operating cash flow line. The, non, the working capital items show up in the operating cash flow segment, capex, and as does depreciation amortization, CapEx shows up in the investing activities. And in CapEx, you should probably also include cash acquisitions. And the new borrowings and debt repaid will show up in the financing section. So this isn't rocket science. You can compute that for every company. And that is what I do for every company in my data set. Now, in terms of, you know, dividends versus buybacks, why do some companies use dividends, others buybacks? Very simply put, the advantage of, if you, if you compare dividends and, and buybacks, here are the big differences. Dividends tend to be sticky. What does that mean? Once companies start to pay dividends, especially if they're regular dividends, it becomes very difficult to walk them back. 
Buybacks tend to be flexible. When you're doing well, you can have large buybacks. When you're doing badly, you stop them all. Markets don't see signals in that. Dividends tend to be timed. They tend to be at the end of every quarter in the US or end of every six months or even a year, but they come out at regular intervals. Buybacks can be opportunistic. What does that mean? You can buy back your shares when the stock price is low. It's not that companies take advantage of that flexibility that much, but they are opportunistic. They don't have to follow a time pattern. And finally, dividends are paid to all shareholders of the company. If you're a shareholder of the company, you're going to get a piece of the dividend. Buybacks return cash selectively only to those shareholders who'd like to cash out. The remaining shareholders get price appreciation instead. See, here's the bottom line. Companies that have large and predictable earnings will tend to be more likely to pay dividends because they can have set the dividends and be okay with them. Companies with more you know, unpredictable earnings where things can happen that can make your earnings swing in both directions are more likely to use buybacks. And that might explain, at least partially, why companies are increasingly shifting from dividends to buybacks. Now, once you have the dividends and buybacks numbers for, for companies, and, and, I have, and I have them for companies, I scale them to things so you can make, compare across companies. If you have dividends, there are two scalars you will see used. One is to scale dividends to market cap, dividends divided by market cap. That's called the dividend yield, very widely used measure among investors. The other is to look at dividends as a percentage of earnings. It's called the payout ratio. The dividend yield is the percentage return you as a shareholder will get from dividends when you invest in a company. So if your dividend yield is 2%, you're getting a 2% return in equity. You're saying that sounds low. Remember, the balance comes from price appreciation. The dividends divided by earnings, the payout ratio, tells you what percentage of your earnings are being paid out as dividends. Obviously, companies that reinvest more will have a lower payout ratio. And companies that don't pay dividends will obviously have a zero payout ratio. Incidentally, dividends can exceed earnings for lots of different reasons, in which case the payout ratio can exceed 100%. So that's the dividend scalars. You're saying, what if we have buybacks? Companies buy back shares for lots of different reasons. They set aside shares to meet employee compensation. They return cash to shareholders who want to sell their shares back. But you can take the total cash return, which is dividends plus buybacks, and scale them to either net income, which will give you kind of a modified payout ratio, or better still to free cash load equity. If you look at the total cash return as a percent of free cash load equity, you'd expect it to be 100%, right? After all, companies should pay out what they can afford to, but they might not. Why? Because companies sometimes accumulate cash. If your cash return is less than your free cash load equity, you're building up a cash balance. If it exceeds your free cash rate equity, you're bidding it down. So I hope you find this data set useful in terms of looking at a company's dividends, <clears throat> or at least in, in industries, dividends, buybacks, and free cash rate equity. Incidentally, when you look at dividends versus, uh, versus free cash rate equity, there are five possible scenarios you can run into where your company can fall into one of the, these five. The first is if you have a company with negative free cash flow equity with no dividends. Now, often young growth companies have negative free cash flow equity and if they're doing the right thing, they should be paying out no dividends, returning no cash. You can also have a company with negative free cash flow equity for whatever reason the company's returning cash, either in dividends or in buybacks. You can have a company with free cash flow equity that's positive, returning no cash, in which case its cash balance is building up. Fourth, you can have a company with positive free cash rate equity with cash is returned, but that cash is less than the free cash rate equity. It's still building up cash because it's returning less than it can afford to. And five, you can have a company with free cash rate equity that's positive, where the cash returned exceeds the free cash rate equity. For whatever reason, I'm not saying it's good or bad, this company is returning more than it can afford to. Notice under one, two, and five, you're going to be burning through cash. Three and four, you're going to be building up cash. And that's how companies can end up with big cash balances or burn through cash balances. I hope you find this data set useful and at least comparing your company to the industry in which, to which it belongs. But take into, into context that dividends, buybacks rep represent what companies return and should be in the statement of cash flows. Free cash flows equity represent what the company could return. And that comparison is critical to assessing dividend policy. I hope you found the session useful. Thank you very much for listening.